Hey. Um, I'm really happy that I get a chance to come and talk about teams because I think actually that's the most important thing. And uh, so, so far in, in my little career, I've got to, uh, to run four companies so far, five I guess if you, if you count Founders House, which technically is a company, but which seems way too much fun to be counted as one. So normally I, normally I just say it's four. Um, but the key thing is actually the team. And, while Danny was talking, I was looking around at some of you guys, and I, I can see that people are thinking, um, yeah, that, that, that's brilliant, that, that sounds really good, but where am I going to start on all of that? And I guess that if a lot of you are in the position where you haven't started a company yet, then it, it must seem like there's an awful lot of things that has to be done from the beginning, right? And it must seem like, like it's almost a little bit overwhelming, how do you get all of these things right? Because so, Daniel and I are really passionate about teams, but the next week you'll talk to someone else who may be really passionate about product, and someone who's really passionate about quality of code, and someone who's really passionate about the finance, and someone who's really passionate about how we should get investment. And I think that the reason that a lot of people don't do anything is because of this like paralysis when we have all these opportunities. And I think the most important thing that I've learned in these last eight years, I think, where I've been doing startups is that that it's okay just to take one little step at a time and to do the best what you could at the time. Because there is no like a, a magic recipe for how we do all of this. It just comes down to the stuff that you're already doing now. And I really like this picture here that says, uh, you know, the way to be successful is to work hard and be nice to people. And I love it because that's something that we can relate to every day, right? Because being a fancy CEO, like, it, the CEO thing is just a little thing that says on your business card, right? In reality, I do all the crappy shit at other places. I do all the stuff that no one else can be bothered to do because my job is to get the team running, right? And to get the company running. So half the time I'm the person who's down getting ink or figuring out why the intern hasn't shown up three times in a row or you know like all the really boring stuff yesterday I spent the whole morning talking to first the tax department and then to a commune the council and I mean that can take the spirit out of anyone but it's not hard right it's not hard it just has to be done and um, and so what I've kind of learned is I didn't have to learn anything new in order to be a good entrepreneur. Actually, I just had to apply a lot of the stuff that I already knew. And that will be the same for you guys. And actually, without noticing, you've kind of already started. Because the way you, you speak to people around you and the role you take when you have like room works and team works and discussions in your classes and the way you uh, interact with your mates and you help them out, that is already the first step in you guys taking the kind of role that you want. And leadership starts there, right? Leadership is not, not something that you have to go to, to CBS and study and you don't need to know the mentors or the secret course. That's all bullshit, right? So it's still someone can monetize the value of leadership. R leadership is that people like you and that people want to work with you and that people would like to go in the same direction of you. So when you walk out of this session today, I would like you to start thinking that now you've already started. Because the first step is the hardest step. So the first step was coming here. And from now on, you're already a step in your journey of creating your company. So from now on, start paying a little bit more attention when you see someone who has a really good attitude, right? It could be someone in your class or one of your friends, like, uh, for example, we have a we have a girl who takes care of the service and community in other places. And uh, I know her because she's the uh, young wife of a guy that used to work for me when I was running VentureCom. And she's so nice. It's impossible to piss this person off. It's impossible. She's nice to everyone. We call it like an any filter, you know, because when a client writes something and now say that's a fucking ridiculous question, like, of course you're not supposed to press those two things after each other. Of course it crashes, right? And then Annie, because she's so nice, then she translates it into any language and going, oh, that's so nice of you to let us know that. And we never thought of looking at it that way. And, and that is a really, really cool skill, but it's not something she built. So um, if I was you, I would start like noticing these people who can do something. It can also be someone who's like really good at, um, you know, some sort of engineering. Maybe there's someone who builds wicked stuff with Arduino or something. And maybe you don't know what you're going to need it for. But just kind of write a little note to yourself somewhere that, okay, these are the people I would like to work with one day. And uh, admittedly, I'm slightly anal and quite well organized, but I have a list of that. 
I have like a spreadsheet of people that when I meet someone, I can be at a conference and I'll go, okay, that guy kicked ass. I would like to work with that guy. And then I, it can either be someone who I think will be really good in an external role. Or it can be someone where I think that guy just seemed really smart. And smart people with a good attitude can learn everything, right? And that's also why the people who come out from here with the best grades are not necessarily the ones who will go out and do the best in life, and they're certainly not the ones who will go out and be the happiest. And as Daniel says, it's because of the attitude, right? You decide what you do. But you already started, so that's the key thing, yeah? So, when you then, so now you started on this journey and now you have to figure out how to take all of these millions of contacts that you, you run into all the time. I mean, it could be that your new CEO is the lady who manages the library and stuff. I mean, these people come from everywhere. Then you have to see, what do I do? And this thing with choosing the right people, um, that, that is the core thing. And, and like Daniel, I would also hire them for attitude. We have, they had a saying when I was in 23 that it was that you hire for attitude and then you train for skills. Like um, right now, as in as long as I can remember, every place is looking for programmers. We're always looking for more programmers, all IT companies are. And I would ten times rather take someone who's a great programmer with a good attitude in a wrong language than someone who's a really good programmer but I don't really like in the right language. And that's because I have to sit with these people all the time, right? I mean, if the shit hits the fan, I need to know that it's someone that I can call at 3 o'clock in the morning and saying, holy fuck, you know, this thing just crashed because we're on some massive website. So, so it has to be people that you like. And the thing that I've learned the hard way is that you also have to be willing to say goodbye when there's stuff that doesn't work out. And as I've been doing this for quite a lot of years, I've become really good at it now. And it sounds bizarre, right, that you can be good at firing people, but, but I, I don't really see it as, as firing people. I mean, all the people who don't work with other places anymore still come in when we have Friday beers. And that's the goal for me, right? I mean, the, it's an honest... It's an honest uh, mistake to ma end up with someone that it doesn't go well with, but it's not okay to leave things on bad terms. And the reason why a lot of people don't jo get people to join their team is that they're afraid that it's going to go up wrong, right? Ah, but he's like quite a good friend of mine, or it's kind of like dating your friend's sister, you know, like, yeah, that sounds like a really good idea if you get married. If you end up sleeping with your best friend, <laughs> it really sucks, right? Um, so. So as long as you always understand how to, to do things in a charming way and understand that you can get out of everything, then I think you can get away with a lot. The second rule that I have for myself is to try to be inspiring. Um, and I mean that in a way that, um, that I don't think that intelligent people work for money. There is no one, I mean, there's no one who, who sits there and who really wants to go home at four o'clock and who, who really gets the most happy from that. Most intelligent people um, want to be challenged. They want to be a part of building something that's bigger than themselves. They want to be entertained. They want to have a good life, you know. They, they want to do something fun. And there's a reason why you could get three times as much working for Nokia, for example, than working for other places or any of the companies that sit in Founders House. And that's because we're not wasting your life. So most people want to be in there. Um, and. I always think that a lot of people fail to tell the story, you know, people go like um, we're going to build this wheel which has like uh, two gadgets more than the one on the market today and you go, yeah, I mean technically I can see that we can do that but I don't really understand why we would do that. Um, so, um, when you start talking to people now and you start telling them about your ideas, even if these are things you're not, not sure if you're going to start something with, then start thinking, why is it that you're doing this? What is the difference? How is it going to change? Is it going to mean that suddenly now uh, handicapped people can bike or we can save uh, a third in labor cost um, because things will work much faster? or? Maybe it's just a step in the evolution of that particular science, which itself is a breakthrough. But we have to understand why it is that we do that. Because people get inspired by stuff like that, and that's what drives people to do stuff. You would also know that some of the topics here that, that you're the best at 
um, are the ones that you're interested in, right? It's because you kind of see a purpose with it. There's a reason why you should do it. It gives you like a satisfaction when, when you get further. And that's not going to stop when you start working. I mean, that's going to continue all your life. I mean, fuck, I really hope so, otherwise it's going to be sad, right? Um, but I think a lot of those people who just sit there counting down to four o'clock um, so they can get home and then their life can start when their work ends. I think that's the saddest thing in the whole world. Because that is just, then you've just wasted that whole part of your life. And apart from the third where you sleep and then the third where you work, then you only have like a little bit left for yourself. So the reason I, I'm in startups is because I don't want to waste that third. The third where I sleep, I can't do anything about. And actually I hate getting up in the morning, so I quite like that part. Um, but, uh, but the third where I'm working, I can decide, and I can decide that I want to do something new. And, um, and it's okay that it's audacious. Like with, um, in every place we want to change the way that people do travel. I mean, I, I want to kill TripAdvisor and we want to be bigger than Lonely Planet. Because ultimately we think that the getting recommendations from a book is like totally 925 or something, right? Like, that's not the way to do it. People, would like to get recommendations from people they trust. I mean, you already do that, right? If you're going somewhere, you ask some people who've been there or some people who are also into that particular thing and you say, okay, okay where should I go? Everyone knows the best recommendations come like that. So I don't understand why the whole industry, and this is a massive industry, right? This is a $500 million industry, is built on the concept that let's take a random stranger, put it in a book which you will then leave in your hotel room, um, and then, and then you have all this like stuff that's not really relevant to you, and that's outdated because by the time it prints, it's obviously outdated already. So what keeps me awake at night and what makes my uh, day happy, spending this third of my life on, is that I, I just would like to change that. And I don't care if it doesn't make me rich because that's not the point of it. The point is that the journey, I, I would like to spend my life changing something that I think is ridiculous and that I think can make people much happier. Um, that's the, so that's the second thing. So the first thing that is that you're always looking for people who you would like to work with and who you think have a special talent. And the second one was that you have to remember to talk about why and think about why you're doing it. The last thing is that uh, you, have to, you have to make people feel good. So um, in like 20 years ago and stuff and in all the American TV shows and stuff, a boss is someone in you know, an expensive suit to sit in a corner office and yells at the other people to get him to do what he wants him to do. And uh, I hope there's no one who was really aiming for that role because unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore and it certainly doesn't in Scandinavia. Because today, if you want people to do anything, you have to convince them and you have to make them want to do it. It's kind of like this old science that women have been doing for a hundred years, trying... They, women know that they have to get their husband to think it was his idea, because then he'll mow the lawn much faster. And being, being a boss is a little bit similar to that. You have to make sure that, that sometimes you take one step back and let other people come in and be part of that process. And rule number one, which I learned from a, a guy who used to go here at DTU, is that never take the credit. The easiest way in the world to get people to feel good is to let them get the credit. And it's also the number one bad habit of a lot of bosses is they'd like to take the glory onto themselves. Um, as a general rule, everything that goes right is because of someone who's not the boss and everything goes wrong is your responsibility. Um, and if you just work from that, um, then everyone will feel much better because people want to be backed up. How many people haven't worked somewhere where if something went wrong and then your boss didn't back you up? Like how does that make you feel, right? If you work in a shop and a customer complains and then your boss automatically assumes that it's you who have been in the wrong, um, that's not the kind of person that you want to be if you want to build something. You kind of want to be the other one. Um, I also try to make sure that I don't make any decisions and as I, as I get more and more confident in being a good entrepreneur and being a good CEO, uh, it's less and less that I say, okay, cut the crap, we're doing that. 
I mean, I will do that if it's necessary because I don't believe in committees and I don't believe in having a million people deciding stuff. But first I will see if the team or the people responsible for that department can come up with a solution. And then we will go with that, even if it's not exactly the way I would have done it. Because one of the things I've had to learn quite the hard way is quite often the way that I would like to do stuff is not necessarily right, right? Even though it seems like such a great idea at the time. Um, so, um, this whole concept of, of ownership is something that we talk a lot about in Scandinavia, but it's something that most people actually uh, don't find that easy to do when they do come out. Um, so I think that's the third thing I would say, so choose the right people, and uh, I agree with Daniel that it doesn't matter what grade they have, and it doesn't matter what kind of IQ and stuff it has, it matters if, if you think they have a special talent, and then it matters that you like them. And uh, one of the things that always irritated me when I was starting my first company up is that everyone always talked in these absolutes. Um, and I was like, but how am I going to start with all of this? Like, it's really nice to say that you should pick a VC that uh, has plenty of money to fund you all the way and you should be in Silicon Valley and you should pick a co-founder who's the opposite of you, totally passionate, doesn't have any family commitments, and all of these things. And it's like, yeah, okay, I'm not an idiot, you know, I've read the book. But how do you do that? And one of the ways that I found out to do is to start with small things. I found out that, especially with, with engineers, because engineers are, are, are a really pressured group, um, price group in society, right? Because we totally need engineers. And there's a reason for that. I mean, we can't do hardly anything. In my industry, we can do nothing without engineers. But it also means that a lot of the good people get a lot of offers already. So if you come out and say, how about you join my crazy idea, you know? I mean, I don't know how we're going to make any money. I don't know if it's possible, but I'm pretty sure it would be a good time. But you have to be totally committed, and you have to, I have to be able to call you at 3 o'clock in the morning. It, is that not a great idea? And the poor person goes like, what, are you, are you on drugs, you know? So what I found out is that sometimes you have to, like, take a little step back and then let people just get to know it a little bit. Just... Um, Often I start uh, with saying, okay, I, I, we would quite like your advice on this. And then get someone to sit down with you for a couple of hours and say, okay, this is the situation I sit with and this is the problem, how would you approach it? And then you also have a chance to see whether that person is any good. And then if it goes well, most people will say, oh, I, I mean, I don't mind, you can call me again if there's something else at another time. And then slowly that person starts getting more and more involved with it and then the person starts doing a little bit of work and then we're, when you're already much further down the track then you can propose that oh, actually maybe you should come on board and at that point it's not you selling the idea to this person, this person already feels involved. Um, and I had that with a, lot of this, uh, with a lot of other things as well like um, I, we really like interns for example. I love having interns because it gives you, it gives people a chance to come and see how it is to work with us and it gives us a chance to try people out and it's not as massive a commitment as what other things are. And today in, in Denmark and in the Western world we're like a little bit paralyzed because we're overwhelmed by choice and sometimes just making it easy for people to say yes is the best strategy that you can do. Um, I think that's probably... Uh I prepared three whole slides, that's the last one. Uh, I write a lot about this uh, because I'm really passionate about teams and, and I, I am lucky enough to get a chance to talk at a fair amount of conferences and a lot of uh, uh, geek events and startup events and stuff like that. And so I do sometimes write about it. So if you're really interested, my blog is up there and feel free to write. And, um, and feel free to come in and visit us at Founders House, there's 17 uh, web and mobile startups sitting all together again to make it more fun and uh, and if you're interested uh, to learn even more then I can also recommend that you start at least part-time by joining another startup so that that step does not seem like quite so overwhelming perhaps you could learn a lot by doing a year or two years in another startup if you're not ready uh, to do it yourself and uh, certainly as I said we're, we're always looking I've been looking for good people the last 30 years I think I will be the next uh, 30 so you know, um, I'm always very approachable and if there's anything I can help or anyone that I can connect you guys with, then, then feel free to uh, let me know. Thank you.
Martina, just a quick idea. Given your former role as CEO of Benchica, it could be really cool if you could just give like a quick and dirty three best advices on winning Venture Cup, submitting the greatest business plan ever. What do people look for? What is your experience with what the judges look for, the panel and all that stuff? Okay, I can definitely do that because I normally I'm in the room where the jury sits when they deliberate, right? Um, or, or I have been for a lot of time. What they really like in Venture Cup is that you have, you have done something. So every time you haven't just thought about something, in the, in the whole Danish academic system we do a lot of thinking and not necessarily very much doing always. So every little thing that you can show that we've tried that. Okay, we called two potential clients, they both said no. Okay, fine, but you called two potential clients, that's better than having done nothing. I have talked to these three guys that I would potentially be interested in working with, fine, that's also a plus. Then uh, I would not write it in, um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is try to write it in a normal language because some of the judges will not be engineers or at least they will not be in your field. Um, so assume, we call it the grandmother test, right? Whatever you send in, your grandmother has to be able to understand it and make sense of it before you should send it in. Um, so I don't know how skilled uh, programmers your grandmothers are, but with mine that means taking out quite a lot of the technical language. Um, so uh, that one I would do, and uh, then I would um, I would focus a lot on the on the team and saying that okay we've got these people that are, are talking on doing it, and it's also okay to say if there's some people that you don't already have, um, like venture Corp, um totally understands the, the stage of which you're at, but it actually shows quite a lot of maturity to say, hey, when we get started, if we get to this level, then we would need a CFO because none of us are really experts in the stuff with money. That's totally fine. It, it shows much more than if you're like, I'm like a one-man band and uh, I think I would probably be able to do all of it by myself. Um, and I'll probably do a pretty wicked job. Um, and there's actually a lot of people who, who think that. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. I think just do it. You're allowed to send in multiple ideas. It's really great for the networking. There's people who've already done it in the jury. And the most valuable thing is just to get started and to see what these people respond to it. Because all the people who decide who goes to the final, uh, they write comments, right? So they'll go in and say, hey, when it comes to the, the technical stuff, I wonder if this is a problem or when it comes to competitors, do you know of these guys over here? So it's really valuable just for the experience. And I think the record is one person sent in, one team sent in 10 ideas. I think they, they got quite a lot of uh, credits for pure spirit in that. So, But just do it. And uh, as we started with, when I told you, you've already started, right? Today was the first step. So now it's just to move further. Any questions before Tina leaves? Because I think you have to go somewhere, right? Yeah. So, any quick questions? Um, anything you're in doubt about? Anything you would like to know more about? Yeah. Let me just uh, give you the mic. It's a kind of a general question, but what was your most memorable moment uh, as a judge? Are you were a judge at the Venture Cup? Yeah. Well, I'm. I'm in the. Um, well, yes and no. So. I was in the jury room because I was the director of it, but I, I don't have a vote. The staff of Venture Cup never have a vote. So, so which, which um, was the most memorable uh, presentation or project that you, you saw at Venture Cup? Um, I think in most general terms, the ones that are the most memorable, there were some that managed to tell a story. And those are the best ones, right? And it, even if there's a couple of, of facts and details missing, the one where you kind of feel like, okay, I get it, I get why, why the world could be better or why this industry could be better if you do that, I think they're the ones that I like the most. Um, and then I just really like the ones where you can see that um, sometimes that it's like people who are not necessarily naturally born presenters, right? But who've like really had to like kick himself and go, okay, fuck. 
fuck yeah, this is going to be the worst 15 minutes of my life, but it's in a closed room and no one's going to know about it, so let's try it. And most people find out that, okay, it's not that bad. And I love to see that because it's like a part of the process. Everyone started like that, you know, even though today you can't get me and Daniel to stop talking. We didn't start like that. We also started out standing over in the corner going, yeah, I don't, I don't really have anything to say, right? Um, so uh, so those ones where you can see that people have just overcome like a tiny little barrier and have gotten a little bit further with themselves, I think you can feel that and the jury can also feel that in the, in the room. <coughs> I, thank you very much for a really good talk. Um, I teach a course where we have groups of uh, entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs. Uh, there's teams of roughly five who are developing their business and technical ideas. Um, and it's becoming apparent that some of the teams uh, have a few core members who are kind of much more motivated and enthusiastic and maybe one or two members who aren't. Yeah. Um, I'm starting to get a little bit concerned as they're coming towards the end if some of them wanted to take the business further. Now at this stage, they've all got kind of equal equity, if you like, in the, in the business. And I'm just wondering how do you deal with that situation where ideally you'd like to be able to, sorry to, uh, for the phrase, but cut <laughs> off the dead wood in, in yeah. some respect. I, you totally cut it off. Uh, I mean, it's who has the right to do that? If, if, there's a, if there's a group and some people really want to drive it forward, and others are not so keen. But I think I think the passionate ones do have it because it's actually not a hard decision. People call these ones hard decisions. It's an uncomfortable decision, but it's not hard because it's so obviously the right thing to do. I think that if it was me, I always try to deal with those situations before they become a problem because. Unfortunately, experience has taught me that things just get worse. Nothing ever magically solves itself because you don't talk about it. Um, so I would probably have that meeting right now if I was the passionate one or the couple of them. And if I, if, as a teacher, I would point that out to the good students and say, hey, before you guys are in this talk, I think you should sit down and have a beer with your teammates and say, hey, it feels like me and Peter are really into this and it feels that you guys see it more as a school project and that's totally fine, but I just think we should talk about what would happen if we were to go further. Because obviously, if you guys want to be a part of it, then you would need to like match the enthusiasm that we do. And then they're not kicked out. Then they get a chance to earn the right back in. But it's also been made quite clear that if you don't earn it, then there is no such thing as a free lunch. I think I'll pass that on word for word. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. I just, uh, well, uh, in line with Thomas's question, but I guess it's getting even more complicated if one group wins the Venture Cup and earns the 250,000 kroner. Yeah. And have to split that in four and kick one or two members out. Yeah. Yeah, uh, totally, and uh, if th there's one thing that uh, Venture Cup will never say, and which I was never allowed to say, but now I can, uh, and that is that you have to set up companies for these ideas if they get into the final, because the tax department, first of all, will flee you, and people will start hating each other afterwards, right? So, if there's anything that has a chance of winning any of the money, I mean, you will know 10 days in advance whether you get into the final and creating even just an IS or an APS or some basic structure takes 48 hours. But I, I think exactly that you need to address the problem before that. Because it may be that a deal I think would be that if, if, these, if the dead wood has also done a lot of work to get it to that victory, then I think it's fair to get some of the money. But they don't get equity and they don't get to, to continue working on the project. Would you know, is there any difference if you make four IS or four, four personal or one APS or would that be the same? I mean, personally, I would, you know, you can, if you have, so for, to set up an in, uh, in, uh, APS, you have to put in 80,000 kroners, right? But those 80,000, the system works in a way you can, if you set up five companies, you can just push the same 80,000 down the chain. So setting up multiple companies is not as expensive as it sounds. So if it was me, then I would set up a, uh, a company for each of those people, even if it's a private company, but an APS if they could afford it, because if they're those kind of personalities, they'll probably need a company at some point in the future anyway, like if you're doing consulting work or anything like that. And then I would have those, the big, the company that owns the idea 
is a shared company and no, but no one owns private stakes in that. And this may perhaps come out of being married to a lawyer, but I think you can never have too many companies, right? <laughs> and the, the expense in the, in the beginning is nothing for, for what is going to hurt you uh, further down the track. One final question. Yeah, um, I have visited the founder's house several times and you are all very good friends and you are having great fun together. And um, how do you deal with friendship and co-working from position of boss? Yeah. I think when I first became a boss that was quite hard. Like when I when I joined uh, Venture Corp was the first company where I came in as the boss. Um, and that was really hard and, and I, I really spent a lot of time trying to figure out at, at which point do I stop drinking and go home, you know, because everyone likes the boss to come out for a few beers, but no one wants, you know, to carry their drunk boss home crying, throwing up in the corner. Uh, I don't know how many people want that with their friends, but definitely not with their boss. Um, I, I think that, um, I think that that if you think of the concept of authority as something that you earn, not something that you take, then it becomes a little bit easier. Because I can easily go out and I have a really good time with the people who work for me. And uh, most of the times, as I said, I won't make the decision. But the reason we're at this stage is also because it is quite clear that if push comes to shove, then I decide. And I will never, I would never tolerate any sort of uncertainty about that because um, because it's not good for productivity. Do you know that saying that a camel is a horse designed by a committee? So if everyone needs to have a little bit of a say, then you just never end up with a very nice looking product in the end. And to avoid any more camels, I make it quite clear that, okay, if it comes to design, then for example, I have a designer co-founder, then she decides. And uh, I will almost let her decide. I can't remember in all the time I've worked with her, but I have it quite clear that if the whole team disagrees and it's something to do with design, then Angelica decides. If the whole team disagrees, but it's something with development, then the guy who, who runs development. But he's also not an idiot, so if it's a back-end problem, then he will generally defer to the guy who, who's the back-end programmer, right? But it's very important that there's no misunderstanding that all of these will probably be the ones who have to say if it's necessary. And if push comes to shove, then I can overrule all of them. Um, and one of the beautiful, beautiful things with doing this for a long time is I never have to. I, I, I can't remember when I've had to be an, an asshole to my team. Like it, it's, if you're like a generally a nice person and people trust you, then I don't think that it is. But I, I think that in the beginning, until you get to that level, yeah, I would probably, um, you know, I would probably not throw up in the corner. Well, um, first of all, thank you for a very nice speech. Um, in um, in the process of creating the A team, um, when you are in need of a person with a very specific set of skills, someone that I will not most likely run into, probably some geek living in a basement somewhere, like yeah. a really stereotype. How do you approach that? Um, I mean. Personally, I see recruitment as an ongoing thing, right? I don't think that you find people by putting an ad in the paper. I think that you need to be visible so that those people know how to find you. And one of the reasons that I started Founders House is that I wanted other places to sit in the coolest place in Copenhagen. So then I started a co-working space where now we have 17 co-working, you know, we have 17 startups in there and we have a robot that live streams stuff and like flying stuff that you can control with your phone and all these kind of little gadgets that make it a cool place for geeks. And that was one of the things that, that I do. And, um, and I know that that's hard when you start, like you just don't just go out and start a co-working space, but I would, I do think that it, it is like a little bit calmer, like if you start going to some uh, spend an hour staying at Friday bar um, and with another department even though you can't see what you're going to use it for because I think the reason that I can get such good talent today is because I've been doing that for many years and a lot of these people are people that then come back to me later either because they've met me once or they've met someone else 
Um, so I would, I would try and go and find them. I think that it's about human connection. And I would attend a lot of Friday bars. And sometimes I do it strategically, right? When I came back, I was away from Denmark for a lot of years. And then I came back to Venture Cup and I could see that we really needed to be in the press because people need to understand uh, that, that we're doing a good job because we need money from sponsors to run it. But I didn't know any journalists. And in a case like that, I'll be totally strategic about it. And I'll figure out which parties, which events, which seminars do journalists go to. And I'll go to them and then I'll drink. I'll just stand by the coffee station and just chip chat to people. And I'll never talk business in the beginning, you know? I'll just, oh, what do you think about that thing? And then I'll make sure to touch base with them afterwards. I'm very diligent with making sure that every contact I get is something that I remain. So I will contact everyone on LinkedIn afterwards. And I'll send them a message and I follow a lot of people on Twitter and I even have I have columns of people that I need to build closer relationships with and then their tweets are separated and I see them and then I'll reply to some of it. Um, and it, it is really crazy things like that, right? There'll be people that um, that I become friends with on Facebook and on all of that sort of stuff because one day I think it would be cool to do something with you. And I hate this networking word because it sounds like it's like a, a scheming some way, right? It's trust. It's about building trust and the, the thing is that it takes a long time to do that. But, uh, but coffee and Friday bars, that's where I would start. <laughs> Uh, you talked about people who look at the time when the time is four. Yeah. I was wondering, do you have children? Do you, some of your colleagues have children? Because sometimes people look at the time when it is four because they have to go and pick the children. Yeah. Not because they're interest, not, not interested in the work. Yeah. But no one is going to pick those children. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any children and neither does any of my, uh, my colleagues in other places, but there are some of the people in Founders House who have children. And what they do is they'll generally turn in a lot earlier than us. One of the things that programmers and entrepreneurs are alike is that we don't count the hours before 10.30 in the morning, right? But it actually turns out there's quite a lot of working time before 10.30. So a lot of the parents, they turn up at 8, right? So they manage to get a lot of stuff done. Then I also have a lot of them, they'll go home at 4, they'll pick up their kids, they'll have dinner, they'll put their beds, kids to bed. And then if there's a lot of stuff needs to be done, they'll work from 9. And I think that's totally fair. Like I don't, I don't care about hours. If you can be the best at what you're doing in three hours a day, I would be happy with that. I'm only interested in results, and I try to give that flexibility to, to co-working. And I think that you should because I think that uh, there's a huge amount of talent in parents. There's a huge amount of talent in women. There's a huge amount of talent in foreigners. If I was to give one tip about how to recruit great people in Denmark, it would be recruit people who don't speak Danish. Because a lot of the established companies won't take people who don't speak Danish. So there's a lot of really top motivated, very talented people out there who can't get work because they're not called Søren Hansen. And it's totally ridiculous, but it's also a good thing, uh, it's a good thing for a startup. Because, I mean, in other places we speak English anyway, I couldn't give it rat's ass whether people speak Danish. I'd much rather you speak Spanish or something that I can use if, if I had to choose. So I guess the answer is I think you should be flexible and I think that's okay. And I don't think anymore that you have to work 100 hours a week. I mean I've done that in the beginning. Now I probably work 60 hours a week but I probably I get a lot more done in the 60 hours than I used to do in the 100. <laughs>